At that time, Jesus came to Jericho and intended to pass through the town. Now a man there named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector and also a wealthy man, was seeking to see who Jesus was. But he could not see him because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When he reached the place, Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, for today I must stay at your house. He came down quickly and received him with joy. When they all saw this, they began to grumble, saying, He has gone to stay at the house of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my possessions. Lord, I shall give to the poor. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I shall repay it four times over. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a descendant of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what was lost. Hello and welcome to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a descendant of Abraham. Aren't we all? That's really, really something that seems to escape us these days. We look, we see people, we see ideologies, and we rejoice in their demise. I remember very, very vividly, and this has been 30, 40 years ago, but, and it was a time when Muammar Gaddafi was in power in Libya. You know, the geopolitical situation, I don't remember everything that went on, but they bombed where Gaddafi was, and his little boy, who was about six or seven years old, they had pictures of this child who had been severely injured in this bombing raid. And there were people who were cheering and so happy, and so happy his child got hurt because now he knows what it's all about. They were cheering that a six-year-old innocent child had been damaged because of a political retribution of his father. There's something in us that allows us to put a label on people. And when we put a label on people, we dehumanize them. They're no longer descendants of Abraham. They become the enemy based on their lifestyle, based on their beliefs, based on what they stand for. And so we find ourselves rejoicing in their misery because they are not one of us. They are. They're descendants of Abraham as well. Now, I'm not going all pacifist and saying, okay, let people come in and terrorize us and burn down buildings and do this, do that, do the other thing. 
and it's okay because you're descendants of Abraham. But I am saying that we need to get out of that idea that if they're communists, if they're terrorists, if they're activists, if they're Bolsheviks, if they're whatever, letting that be our excuse to rejoice in their misery, their pain, their downfall, their hurt, that's a really hard thing to do. That really is a hard thing to do. When I hear Al-Qaeda say that one day the ISIS flag is going to fly from the obelisk of St. Peter's in Rome, I get upset. I get upset. But for me to dehumanize people, and we do it with labels, we do it with labels, is absolutely wrong and unforgivable. I can look today and in this very, very divided climate, I can see, I can see people I really don't like. I really don't like what they stand for. I really don't like what they advocate. Do you realize since May of 2022, in the United States, 73 problem pregnancy centers who help people who are pregnant, 73 have been firebombed, desecrated, destroyed. 83 Catholic churches have been attacked because they think we stand for the sanctity of human life. And in standing for the sanctity of human life, they accuse us of being anti-woman or they make the statements that we want women to be slaves today to their pregnancies. I hate what these people stand for. I can't rejoice. And let's say one of them goes to throw a Molotov cocktail and it blows up on them and yay, served them right. I can't do that. I can't do that. They are descendants of Abraham. And this is very, very, very difficult in a divided world. I look at things going on between Russia and Ukraine and I go, you know, somebody's got to stop this madman. As much as I despise that mentality, as much as I despise the nuclear threats, to say that these people were sinners and they deserve it, or they don't deserve to be dealt with. It's just wrong. And it's very, very difficult. One of the things that sets Christianity apart from all other mainline religions is forgiveness. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The measure you measure with will be measured back to you. Your heavenly father will treat you in exactly the same way you treat one another. And so as I sit here speaking about it, believe me, I'm not saying let people run over you, let people kill you, let people do whatever. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that we need to readjust that thought that these are the bad guys. And in their demise or in their death or in their downfall, I am so excited and I'm so happy they deserve it. That's very, very difficult for us to look at. Let's bring it a lot closer to home. And we, we all know people. We all have people in our families. We all know people have done things they shouldn't do, live lifestyles they shouldn't live, have habits in their lifestyles that they shouldn't have. They shouldn't have. 
and something happens. Well, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Serves them right. They shouldn't have been doing this, shouldn't have been doing that, shouldn't have been doing the other thing. I agree. They should not have been doing it. We don't dismiss descendants of Abraham. We don't rejoice in anyone's misery and anyone's downfall. And that is so very, very hard for us to deal with. I've got this queer fascination with Nazi Germany. I watch the, the History Channel all the time. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at how someone can take over the psyche of a country and have them perform all sorts of atrocities and think they're doing it for the right reason and for the fatherland and for whatever was involved in that. And I'm, and I'm sure Adolf Hitler had to face God like everyone else had to face God. But the reality is, is we have a tendency to vilify. And one of the buzzwords for vilification is those people. You know, those people, those people who, and you can fill in the blanks. You can fill in the blanks for whoever those people are. And somehow we think it's okay for us to rejoice in those people and their downfall and in their hurt and in their anger. And when we say the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, the same God who created me created that terrorist. The same God who created me created that activist. The same God who created me created the person who are now destroying churches, now destroying, you know, pregnancy centers, now living alternate lifestyles, that same God created us all. And learning how not to excuse our own hatred, dismay, or even rejoicing over their downfall, their pain, or their anguish is very, very important. Uh, maybe if more people didn't have that those people mentality. Maybe those people could be we people. Maybe we could solve it together. But as long as we're radically divided against those people, we will never find a solution together. And we are going to have to find the solution if we're ever going to get out of this great division, this great anger, this great separation, this great pain that exists in our world. It exists not only, but in part, because we refuse to deal with those people. And as long as those people can be vilified in our hearts and in our minds, then we can never work together. And we are part of the problem, not the solution. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bayou from Close to Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today. And a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need. And also your financial support. We are donor driven. And that is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply. And mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the Gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. And he came down quickly and received him with joy. When they all saw this, they began to grumble, saying, He has gone to the house of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my possessions, Lord, I give to the poor. 
And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I shall repay it four times over. Hello and welcome back to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Byer, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. That last segment was tough, talking about those people. And in the time of our Lord, those people would have been the tax collector. They were a little bit more severe than the IRS. They were the ones who had the power to collect tax, to set it, and basically do whatever they wanted to do. And so a tax collector was more than just someone who sat at his desk and someone who had to come in and pay X number. They were people who really were legalized criminals for the day, okay? legalized by the county, whatever, uh, by the government. And so when Zacchaeus was recognized by the Lord, when Zacchaeus was invited by the Lord, his first statement was to say, busted, I'm guilty. I know that I've done what was wrong. And now I'm going to do everything that I can to make it right. I am going to change things. I am going to give away to the poor because all the wealth that I've accumulated has probably been on the backs of the poor. They'll get it back. If I've extorted anyone, which I do all the time, if I've extorted anyone, I'll pay him back four times. The idea that when we come to God, we come with different hearts. And a change of heart in the sight of God is what all of us, all of us need to make the reparations. The idea that there are only certain people worthy of God and worthy of the church is it's not from God, it's from us. I don't know how many of you have ever lived in a small town, but my first pastorate was in a very small town. We didn't even have a red light, okay? So you live in these small towns and you know, usually confession is old news. You've already heard it on the street somewhere, it's okay. And, you know, everybody knows whose check is good and whose husband is not, all right? So living in a small town has a dynamic all its own. And I, I had this gospel and, and a nice little newly renovated church. And I had this old couple, sweet, sweet old couple. But, but, but he was deaf, okay? And, when, and whenever he whispered to his wife, okay, it was that stage whisper that everyone in church could hear him talking to Mama Rose, okay? So anyway, I, I read the gospel, put the book down, and I said, I can't believe it. Look who's coming in church. I said, the roof is going to cave in. Of course, I was making this up, okay? He can't see and he can't hear. He's going, who is it, Mama Rose? Who is it? He's waiting for, who, who's coming? You know, and the idea that only certain people belong in church. Well, I know that person. I know what she does. I know what he does. They got their nerve coming in church. Excuse me, who in the hell do you think you are? If you say they got their nerve coming in this church, the greatest sinner in the world has every right to be in that church as the most virtuous person in the world has a right to be in, in that church. And when you think you're better than someone else. And this is, here, here again, we, we run into the Pharisees. 
Oh, look at this guy. He goes to a sinner's house. Yeah. That's where he goes. Those are the people who need the Lord. Those are the people we need to in invite into church, you know? And, and if the Lord goes into the bar room, those are the people who near, need to hear the message, okay? I've been ordained less than a year. The parish where I was, we had a, uh, we had a, an apartment complex in the back of it. And I had been dealing with this woman who, she was a victim of, of domestic abuse and she had left her husband. She was living in the apartments. I get a call, almost 11 o'clock at night. He, guy just beat the dickens out of her. Please, can you come? Can you help me? And everything like that. So I'm going into an apartment complex. I'm a young priest. I'm 26 years old at the time. Um, I'm a young priest. I'm going into a divorced woman's apartment at 11 o'clock at night. Oh, do I wear my collar? Well, if I wear my collar, people who don't know me, hey, look at the priest sneaking around at 11 o'clock at night. If I don't wear my collar, people who know me say, huh, he doesn't wear his collar to go make house calls, okay? What do you do? put my coat and collar on and went. Whatever they want to believe, they, they're going to believe. Not a whole lot I can say about it. They're going to believe what they want to believe. My point is, I had to be there. The optics looked really bad for a 26-year-old new, newly ordained priest going to a divorced woman's apartment at 11 o'clock at night who just had the heck beat out of her by her husband. But I wasn't going to say, no, this will look too bad. I can't come. And we're so very, very quick to think that we're the people who belong in church. We're the people that, it, that, that God wants, not those other people. You know, those other people. And when our Lord says in the scriptures, go and learn the meaning of this word, of these words, it's mercy I desire. Not sacrifice, but it's mercy I desire. And we can be very smug. We can be very smug of not wanting to deal with people like that, not wanting to be associated with people like that, and this is exactly what the Pharisees were accusing Jesus of. He was going to Zacchaeus' home, who was a great sinner, who was publicly a sinner, and did his sinning with the government's approval. But he's the one who needed our Lord. He's the one who was there with them. What are we worried about? What are we worried about? You know what? I got to stand before God. I don't need to stand before everybody in that little town or whoever may have seen me go into that apartment. I know what I did. I know what I didn't do. Yeah, you know, so what? You know, yeah, it doesn't look the best, but I'm not going to walk away from someone who's hurt and in need just because other people might think otherwise. But only we, only we have the ability to make that decision. And that idea of reaching out to people in need, entering into their story, entering into their situation, not thinking that they are above. <laughs> A lady come to me and she comes in the confessional and she goes, well, I got, I, I got somebody coming and he's been away from church for a long time. He's a rough life, this, that, and the other. And please be nice to him. Sure, I will. Well, he comes in, goes through the whole sordid story. But unfortunately, he stole someone's purse and left church, okay? I mean, but 
the lady did the right thing. The lady did the right thing by reaching out. This kid had been alienated. He had been separated, had a tough life, made bad decisions, you know, didn't have a whole lot going for him. She wanted to bring him back to God. And, you know, and she did everything right. She did everything she was supposed to do, trying to help this young man, you know, cleanse himself and, you know, do everything he needed to do. And she was great. He wasn't ready. Was it a mistake? Not on her part. She did what she did out of the goodness of her heart. And, and look, he looked pretty rough and had the red spiked hair and the, the motorcycle thing going on and, you know, you know, more tattoos in a parlor. He had the whole deal going. But this lady reached out and she tried to help this kid who had been alienated. And today when we read the judgment of other people watching Jesus, calling people to himself, and then judging them because they thought he shouldn't be with sinners, he ought to be with the wonderful people like us. Who's ever done that? Who does that? This is all part of that, Lord, when do we see you hungry, naked, ill? This is all part of being in need and just turning away from them. I don't like those people. I don't like to be around that type. They make me feel dirty, nasty, whatever. If you don't go, who's going to go? If not you, then who? If, if not now, then when? When is someone going to reach out and offer to them the mercy, the love, the healing that God promises us. And it's our responsibility, especially among those we know, especially among our family, especially among our friends and our relatives. We're not the holy ones. We're the ones who are still trying to be holy. But it's our job not to pass judgment, but to find people and bring them back to the Lord. We have a come home for Christmas campaign Let's do it year round. Thanks for being with us, and may God bless you each day in your walk with the Lord. God bless. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Join us here in this station each week as we strive to bring you the gospel message with great clarity and great charity, and may God bless you in your walk each day.